In a future world, multiple regions across the globe have been invaded by aliens, and it has been 121 days since the disaster broke out. Alien spores have contaminated 30% of the Earth's air, forcing refugees to relocate to temporary shelters. For the past four months, people have suffered greatly from the catastrophe. At this moment, in the streets of Osaka, Japan, alien creatures are relentlessly hunting down residents. They look like spiders and move swiftly, with long legs as sharp as harpoons. Fellow compatriots on the streets are dying one after another. Scientist Mitsuki rushes out to take command. She ignites the abandoned cars placed on the streets, creating a natural barrier with the exploding fuel tanks. It appears these creatures fear fire. Mitsuki continuously attacks with homemade frangible grenade. But there are too many monsters. Mitsuki alone cannot exterminate them all, so she can only do her best to save as many people as possible. Just then, a helicopter arrives overhead. Mitsuki believes they are from the Earth Defense Alliance, and quickly runs over to seek help. Unexpectedly, two men forcibly carry Mitsuki onto the helicopter. This group of people is a private armed organization of Dharma Tech. They hold down Mitsuki, who is struggling incessantly, and explain, with your strength alone, you can never win this war. The place we're taking you to has resources that can save all of humanity. Upon hearing this, Mitsuki gives up struggling. After a long flight, she arrives in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. Outside the window is a giant alien spacecraft. Four months ago, Dharma Tech seized an alien spacecraft and invested a significant amount of resources and effort into researching it. However, there has been no progress so far. So the person in charge, James, invited Mitsuki. Her coding skills helped the Alliance Army take control of the alien spacecraft. James believes that Mitsuki can solve the problem before entering the spacecraft. All personnel must accept tests. The staff will ask various questions to assess Mitsuki's mental state. When the doctor mentions her old friend, Mitsuki suddenly loses control of her emotions. She removes the equipment and leaves away. The staff determines that she is not suitable to enter the spacecraft. But James can't afford any more delays. If they can't produce research results soon, the authorities will revoke Dharma Tekka's rights to study the spacecraft. That's why James makes an exception and allows Mitsuki to enter. For safety, DR Curls accompanies her throughout the process. This alien spacecraft is different from human technology. There are microscopic neural pathways on the walls, more like manipulable limbs than machinery. The spacecraft has an area that is comparable to Canada's, and at its center lies a massive energy entity, which is the intelligent core of the entire spacecraft. Mitsuki's task is to enter it, and attempt to communicate with the energy entity. Everyone who entered before her has failed. They lose partial memories, and some have suffered severe neurological damage, remaining unconscious to this day. That's why James had Mitsuki undergo the mental test, and the doctor repeatedly asked if she was ready, but Mitsuki firmly accepts the challenge. She stands fully armed in front of the energy entity, and the doctor transmits the frequency of the message to Mitsuki's wristwatch, attempting to communicate with the spacecraft in this way, and Mitsuki's performance is indeed impressive. As the energy entity actively approaches her, this situation inspires all the researchers. Mitsuki continues to switch to different frequencies, and the reaction of the energy entity becomes even more intense. It even plays a human song. There seems to be a special connection between it and Mitsuki. Meanwhile, the alien attacks on India are spreading westward to Pakistan, triggering a refugee crisis. Single mother Anissa is stealing from a gas station with her children. The young daughter is responsible for distracting the owner, while the older brother seizes the opportunity to steal food and tools. The mother hides behind the car, refueling, but the owner quickly realizes something is amiss. He picks up a gun and tries to catch Anissa, but the entrance gate has already been blocked. The two children take the opportunity to slip out the back door and hide in the car. Anissa drives away, and the family of three escapes to a residential area. They find an empty house to rest temporarily. The two children have been on the run all along, and really want to settle down here. But Anissa firmly refuses to stay. Residential areas are vulnerable to alien attacks, and the struggles among surviving humans are difficult to handle. Anissa's husband was killed by humans and her eldest son, Luke, doesn't want to listen to her. He takes the metallic object from the bag without permission, which seems to be very important. Anissa becomes extremely nervous, but it's her younger daughter who ultimately mediates the situation. Luke reluctantly agrees to follow his mother and continue their journey. The three of them pass by a small village, where a group of soldiers is having a meal not far away. Anissa asks the children to wait in the car, while she plans to go down and gather some supplies. Luke starts acting recklessly again, he sneaks out of the car to steal gasoline from the soldiers. By the time Anissa notices, it's already too late. She can only stare at her son, praying that he won't get caught. 
Unfortunately, things don't go as planned. Luke is caught right by a soldier who just finished using the restroom. Seeing this, Anissa conceals the gun behind her back, and approaches calmly, pretending to explain the situation. She hopes the soldiers will let her disobedient son go. However, the soldiers are cautious and suspicious. They suspect Anissa to be a member of a rebel organization, and without hesitation, they proceed to search her and the car. As expected, they find weapons, and the black metallic object. The soldiers detect that the metal is of extraterrestrial origin, and upon checking Anissa's information, they find out she is a wanted criminal. The soldiers lock Anissa and her family in a transport vehicle, where they find another man named Clark, who is also restrained. Despite his friendly demeanor, Anissa remains cautious, and refuses to engage in too much conversation with him. When the vehicle was halfway on the road, they encountered an injured girl. The soldiers quickly got out of the car to assess the situation, but to their surprise, armed individuals emerged from both sides of the woods. The group swiftly subdued the soldiers, and shortly after, they knocked on the vehicle's door. Upon hearing this, Clark warned Anissa and the others to cover their ears. The next moment, the door lock was blasted open. It turned out that Clark was the leader of this group. He didn't trust the Alliance military, so he formed an armed organization, seeking to survive in the apocalypse through their own abilities. Clark and his group swiftly took the supplies and left, without harming the Alliance soldiers. Anissa decided to follow them to their secret base, and planned to resume their journey the next morning. Clark couldn't help but speak up. In the apocalypse, it's hard to survive alone. Late at night, Anissa held the metallic object and contemplated. But unexpectedly, the patterns on it started to fluctuate, and Luke even heard humming sounds. Could it be that the metallic object is related to the energy entity from the spaceship? At the same time, a boy who had been unconscious and unresponsive, showed faint signs of awakening. The boy's name is Tim, and he had an accidental connection with extraterrestrial beings, through which he commanded them to cease their attack. However, this connection left him in a state of severe coma. His friend Lisa witnessed the entire process, but his mother and others didn't believe her words. After all, the Alliance military couldn't even deal with the extraterrestrials. So what could an underage boy do? But Lisa firmly believed that Tim was different, but they were separated, and she had no idea if Tim was alive or dead. Lisa lived in a refugee camp on the outskirts, where she learned about the crisis outside through leaflets. She was unwilling to hide in the darkness and waste her life. Thus she left a farewell letter to her mother, and embarked on a journey alone to find Tim, before they lost contact. Tim was receiving treatment in a hospital, so Lisa planned to go to the hospital to check on him. She quickly arrived in a small town, where gruesome corpses were scattered everywhere, missing persons posters covered the streets and alleys, witnessed too many broken families. Just as Lisa was feeling heartbroken, a police car suddenly appeared, and they shouted that the air in the area was toxic, intending to forcefully transfer Lisa to a shelter. Lisa's destination was the hospital, and she couldn't afford to be captured by them. She crawled into an alley and escaped into a heavily polluted zone. Two soldiers, unable to wait for Lisa any longer, left behind a gas mask and departed. Lisa put on the mask and continued her journey. After several twists and turns, she found the local hospital. She went to the morgue first to confirm, and fortunately, there was no sign of Tim's body. Lisa found the reception computer and looked up the files, discovering that Tim had been transferred to the ST Paul Hospital in Paris by the Earth Defense Alliance. Now she had a clear objective and Lisa's heart was filled with hope. Meanwhile, in Florida, USA, there was someone else who knew that Tim was different. His name was Bernie, a retired soldier. At this moment, a family party was taking place in the backyard of his villa, as Bernie gazed at the extraterrestrial spaceship overhead, and his family enjoying themselves. He couldn't help but feel a sense of absurd detachment. It seemed that the humans in the safe zone didn't care about what was happening outside, but Bernie couldn't forget his comrades who died tragically and couldn't assimilate into his mundane life. He drove to a military-controlled cyber cafe, and took out a tattered sketchbook, filled with drawings that Tim had sketched based on his visions. Bernie firmly believes that these doodles are related to extraterrestrial beings, so he comes to research whenever he has time. His family notices Bernie's worries and encourages him. If he's truly unwilling to give up, then he should hit the road and search for answers. Soon after, Bernie finds a crucial clue. Tim's drawings have appeared in a cornfield in McCurtain County. He immediately packs his belongings and sets off overnight. Unexpectedly, there are checkpoints set up outside of McCurtain County. Why would a normal small town be heavily guarded, and strictly prohibit passing vehicles? Bernie becomes even more convinced that something fishy is going on. He puts on his previous military uniform, and climbs over the protective net in the woods. Bernie walks into the military command center. He falsely claims to be a soldier sent from superiors. 
He was delayed for some time due to an alien attack on the way. The guard, seeing him act natural, allows Bernie to go to the second floor to report to the sergeant. Instead of looking for a sergeant, he sneaks out through the back door. He sneaks into the most mysterious tent. The tent is filled with glass jars cultivating a large number of extraterrestrial plants. Bernie leans in for a closer observation. Unexpectedly, the contents inside suddenly expand, scaring him and causing him to make a sound. Attracting the attention of the soldiers, Bernie explains that he got lost and accidentally wandered in. However, the base has already found out that he is a veteran soldier, so they lock Bernie up in a detention cell and confiscate his backpack. Bernie is afraid of losing his notebook. Fortunately, the leader tells him that a vehicle will take him out of the state early tomorrow morning. We will return all personal belongings to you. Bernie's story has come to a temporary end. Let's go back to Lisa's side. On the other side, Lisa arrives at the largest survivor camp in the area. She wants to find other friends. Luckily, Lisa encounters her good friends Dua and Alf. She shares her purpose with both of them. After discussing, the three of them decide to travel to Paris together. When night falls, they sneak into an underground parking lot of a luxurious mansion to steal a car. This family is really super wealthy. The garage is filled with luxury cars, and the keys are hanging on the wall. Excitedly, Alf chooses a Porsche, but accidentally triggers the alarm, alerting the homeowner. Luckily, the adults are not at home. Only the boy Monty and his younger sister, Amy, are guarding the house. Their parents have been on vacation abroad and have not returned. The two children have been guarding the house and refusing to leave. They have been surviving on snacks for many days. Monty doesn't care about them stealing the car. He just wants the three of them to leave as soon as possible, while Amy insists on following them to save the earth. Moreover, Lisa and the other two don't know how to drive. Only Monty knows. The most important thing is that Monty's father has an apartment in Paris, where they can stay. So, Monty leaves a note for his parents in the garage and starts driving. The scene switches to Mitsuki's side, where she has exceeded the time limit, and has to temporarily leave Energy Entity. Although there was some progress in this attempt, there is only one specific high-frequency signal that is irregular in appearance. Sometimes it occurs every few days, and sometimes every few hours. At this moment, the doctor asks Mitsuki to undergo a physical examination. Fortunately, she shows no abnormal signs, and her consciousness is very clear. Mitsuki unintentionally passes by a room, where scientists who have interacted with Energy Entity are gathered, including Nobel Prize winners. However, each person appears dazed, unable to recover from their mental torment. Deep in thought, Mitsuki leaves the medical room, but unexpectedly notices the spaceship structure above her gradually becoming invisible. She immediately rushes back to the control center, and asks the staff to repeat the previous actions, while they were only conducting data analysis. So reluctantly, they comply. Mitsuki runs back to monitor the spaceship's antenna structure, and discovers that the antennas become invisible when the transmission frequency is set to 90. The group accidentally triggered the invisibility signal, indicating that the spaceship emits different signals outward through various frequency bands. Mitsuki steps outside to catch her breath. The sand on the ground forms regular patterns due to the vibrations caused by the spaceship's frequency, and the birds in the sky are flying in formation, possibly affected by the frequency interference. Suddenly, everything becomes clear to her, and she immediately runs back to retrieve all the high-frequency signals that have appeared in the past four months. Mitsuki points out that this signal matches a cubic spline curve, indicating that the spaceship is likely seeking help from the mothership. If her guess is correct, the next signal will appear at 5.32 a.m. The staff members are somewhat puzzled. What is the use of knowing this information? Are we supposed to intercept the distress signal? Mitsuki immediately denies it. What we need to do is not intercept, but hack the mother ship following the signal. Mitsuki stays awake all night to confirm whether her speculation is correct. Soon, it's 5.32 a.m., and indeed, that high-frequency signal appears. Mitsuki immediately tells James about the infiltration plan. After listening, he raises a question. If that is a distress signal sent to the mother ship, why hasn't anyone come to rescue this spaceship? Mitsuki explains that perhaps the mother ship received the distress signal but deemed it unworthy of going through the trouble of rescue. Regardless, this is a significant breakthrough. If we can truly infiltrate the mothership, and disable the invisibility of all alien spacecraft, the military can use nuclear bombs to bring them down. However, the wreckage from the shootdown will inevitably fall to Earth, causing unavoidable casualties. James believes that sacrifices are inevitable in war, and besides, 71% of the Earth is covered in water, so it might not hit populated areas. He is willing to take the risk. James immediately relays the plan to the leader of the Alliance military. The leader of the Alliance military initially strongly opposes it, 
but upon reflection, realizes there is no other option, delaying further would lead to inevitable deaths, so it's better to take a gamble. According to the analysis, tomorrow morning at 9.42 a.m., the spaceship will send a new wave of signals, and Mitsuki will seize the opportunity to infiltrate the mothership, and disable the invisibility command, but she can only sustain it for a maximum of 30 minutes, therefore, the Alliance military's nuclear firepower only needs to target the sky and launch in time. Meanwhile, inside the police station in McCurtain County, Bernie was locked up overnight without even a duty officer present. After waiting for so long, he finally encounters a woman with afro hair who asks him to wait for a few more hours. The woman says there is a shortage of personnel in the station right now, and someone will take you out of town later. Then, the afro hair woman receives a phone call. It's another report of a resident going missing. There haven't been any invasion incidents in McCurtain County recently, yet people keep mysteriously disappearing. There are nearly 30 missing persons posters on the wall. The woman joined the police station to help specifically with these missing persons cases. The soldiers, police, and various organizations in town are all busy dealing with research on extraterrestrials. Everyone wants to solve the problem at once, but nobody cares about these individual disappearances. They are not necessary sacrifices for the war. They are someone's mother, someone's only child. Every human life is precious, but the woman can't find any help and the sheriff has been indifferent to the missing cases. Bernie, who survived on the battlefield, understands the woman's feelings very well and says he can help. Bernie carefully examines the missing person's posters on the wall. The dates of each person's disappearance are marked above. He suddenly thought of something. Bernie asks the woman to take out a sketchbook, and flip to a specific page. The pattern on the page matches the badge of the missing old sheriff, and the numbers written in the sketchbook correspond to the various disappearance dates. Bernie has a premonition that he is getting close to the truth. The scene shifts. Anissa's family stayed overnight at the camp, and Luke enjoyed this stable life. However, Anissa urged him to pack up quickly, and head to the next refugee center in two minutes. Clark advised her to relax a bit. If the string is too tight, it will break. But Anissa believed that having a sense of crisis was a good thing. It was because she remained vigilant at all times, that she could survive in the apocalypse. Soon, the three of them followed Clark's car to the next refugee center. Unexpectedly, they received a distress signal halfway through the journey, indicating that a resident was trapped in a canyon. Clark immediately decided to go for the rescue, but Anissa didn't want to risk taking the child along. Since she was riding in someone else's car, she had no decision-making power. Clark parked the car on a high ground near the canyon to assess the situation. They saw a family of three trapped in a car, with approximately six aliens around. Clark orders everyone to bring flamethrowers, and enter the canyon for the rescue mission. Before leaving, he instructs his daughter, little Clark, to stay in the car, and hands the car keys to Anissa. In case something goes wrong, Anissa can escape by driving the car. As Clark and the others venture deeper into the canyon, everyone is getting nervous. Numerous cries for help come through the car's radio. Little Clark worries about her father's safety, and rushes out of the car. Seeing this, Anissa plans to drive away but Luke stopped her. He can't just abandon his father, and let Clark and the others die. Midway through Luke's words, he suddenly stops as he sees a large amount of aliens appearing on the hillside. Luke rushes into the canyon, and Anissa hands the backpack to her daughter and chases after her son. On the other side, the Earth Defense Alliance is deploying in a tense manner, and the representative from India is somewhat dissatisfied with the plan. What if something goes wrong during the launch, and the intercontinental ballistic missile lands right above their heads? The leader stated that she has already given the order instructing all agents to detonate the missiles in the air if they fail to hit the spaceships, aiming to minimize casualties. Soon, nuclear weapons across the globe are put on standby, and the leader initiates a global broadcast, announcing that the counterattack against the alien invaders will take place at 9.42 am today. Her father once said, never let people see you with your head down. Now she earnestly asks everyone to look up at the sky, and witness this mission together. As the countdown reaches zero, Mitsuki swiftly follows the signal and hacks the mothership, and the alien spacecraft in the sky gradually becomes visible. With a command from the leader, the nuclear missiles are simultaneously launched into the sky, resulting in a massive explosion. The enormous spaceship crashes into the ocean. People around the world cheer with joy. After enduring four months of painful failures, humanity has finally won a battle. In this operation, seven alien spacecraft were shot down. As the spaceships crash, the aliens lose their energy and die one after another. Clark and the others survive as a result, and Anissa climbs out of the canyon with her son. However, it's strange that their youngest daughter is missing from the car. Could it be that those aliens didn't die at all, and captured Anissa's daughter? 
On the other side, Lisa's group of five is driving towards Paris, but unexpectedly encounters a massive traffic jam ahead. Everyone looks up at the sky. The five of them didn't listen to the radio. They have no idea about the Alliance's bombing plan at all. Lisa gets out of the car and asks the soldier on duty, only to find out that a train was delayed, and the entire reconnaissance team went missing after inspecting it. As a result, the French authorities have requested the closure of the entrance, making it temporarily impassable. As for looking up at the sky, they are waiting for the Alliance's counterattack against the aliens. Upon hearing this, Lisa tells Monty to turn around, as they can walk through the tunnel to reach Paris. Lisa, regardless of the Alliance's actions, won't give up on finding Tim. The five of them take a deep breath and enter the tunnel. They haven't gone far when they come across several corpses, presumably the missing reconnaissance team. The next moment, an alien appears ahead, and it's about to charge towards them. However, Monty's foot gets stuck in the railroad tracks. At this critical moment, the alien suddenly collapses to the ground. It's likely that the Alliance destroyed their spaceship, causing them to lose their vitality. Meanwhile, Amy discovers more aliens, all of them curled up into spherical shapes, resembling a state of dormant rather than death. At this moment, Lisa notices that the groundwater is trembling. They place cups of water to test it, and find that the vibrations continue, accompanied by faint sounds. A burst of unease surged in her heart, perhaps the aliens haven't given up on the invasion. These frequencies are the signals they are emitting. Lisa immediately shouts for everyone to leave, while the aliens behind them are emitting a faint glow. As the five of them continue to venture deeper, they come across more and more corpses on the ground. It appears that these people intended to close the Iron Gate, but were attacked by the aliens. At this moment, Amy is closely watching the tunnel behind them. You're right. We're fine. We're fine, Penny. We're fine. We're fine. We're fine. Meanwhile, inside St. Paul Hospital, patients gather around a radio, sharing good news. Each person has a joyful smile on their face. Only one calm female doctor enters a special laboratory, where there are many children who can sense the aliens. The doctor's job is to gather information. Unconscious Tim lies in a separate room. Although doctor's colleagues believe he will never wake up, the female doctor remains hopeful. This is because Tim experiences tremors seven times per hour, indicating his brain is still active, although her colleagues don't think so. After shooting down the spaceship this time, the aliens in different locations all died. Perhaps tomorrow the research program will be concluded, and everyone can return to their normal lives. Little did they know that an accident would soon occur. Late at night, the reception received a distress call from a nearby hospital, and suddenly a large number of patients who had been attacked appeared in various places. Shortly after, loud crashing sounds were heard outside. The female doctor quickly rushes out to investigate, and finds that an ambulance has crashed into a pillar. She goes to check on the condition of the driver. The female doctor realized the situation was not good. The alien's counterattack is likely about to begin. She ran back to the base to evacuate everyone, and take away all the research data. The female doctor stood by Tim's bedside. They didn't have the ability to take away the comatose patients. She told Tim that he must survive this disaster. The other five people on the other side heard strange roaring sounds. They quickly closed the iron gate. The next second, the aliens suddenly rushed over. They became bigger and more terrifying. Alf took out a hairspray and a lighter, trying to disperse the aliens with fire, but soon he despairingly discovered that these creatures had overcome their fear of fire. Seeing that the iron gate was about to be breached, they hurriedly ran through the back door and tightly twisted the valve. The group was drenched in cold sweat, not daring to waste any more time, and quickly continued toward the exit. They came across the train that hadn't reached its destination and immediately knew that an accident had occurred. Monty was worried about his sister's condition so he requested to rest for a while. He found an abandoned car, and let Amy sleep in the back seat. Alf, on the other hand, took Dua to find supplies. Lisa looked at Monty and his sister, feeling a sense of self-blame for a moment. If it weren't for her insistence on coming to Paris, they wouldn't have been trapped in the tunnel. Lisa was alone in the tunnel, trying to relax. But unexpectedly, Tim suddenly appeared in front of her. She thought it was a dream, but the next second, Tim spoke. He said that after establishing contact with the aliens, he felt a mysterious force guiding him. Tim followed that force and entered the alien's world, which caused him to fall into a coma and couldn't wake up. Now Tim is exerting all his efforts to communicate with Lisa. Upon hearing this, Lisa told Tim not to give up, assuring him that she would definitely rescue him. After Tim finished speaking, his consciousness disappeared in the tunnel, and the aliens entered the piston decompression pipeline. Soon, they would break into the hiding place of the five individuals. 
Fortunately, Amy heard the sound inside the pipeline, and she quickly rushed back to inform everyone, the monsters are about to arrive, we must leave immediately. Meanwhile, Monty took advantage of everyone's rest, and used mountaineering equipment to find a way. Everyone held onto the rope and passed through the abandoned cars, entering another set of tunnels before the alien monsters arrived. At this moment, the aliens were chasing them from behind, and they ran desperately forward. They finally found an exit, but unexpectedly, sandbags were piled up ahead, and explosives were placed around the walls. It seemed that the people outside wanted to blow up the tunnel entrance, and completely trap the aliens inside. Everyone desperately shouted for help, and luckily the workers outside heard their voices. They quickly reported to their superiors. The soldiers opened a small opening to rescue several children from the tunnel, but the next second, the aliens also caught up. The commanding officer immediately ordered the bomb to be detonated. As the explosion sounded, a scorching heat wave swept in, and the collapsed tunnel entrance completely blocked the aliens inside. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief, but after the ordeal, Dewar's leg was severely injured. They had him leave with the military doctor, while the remaining four continued to search for Tim. Meanwhile, the hospital was in chaos, and everyone had already evacuated. Only Tim was still struggling in the realm of consciousness. He didn't forget his promise to Lisa, and was fighting with all his might. Anisha and the leader of an armed organization, Clark, searched around in their vehicle for any traces of the girl. Finally, they found tire tracks from a military vehicle on the sandy ground, along with Sarah's footprints not far away. This indicated that the girl had been taken by the military. A person from the organization who was on night duty came to report that they saw a military vehicle passing by last night, heading south. If they continued south along the interstate highway from this location, there was a military camp of the Alliance. It was highly likely that Sarah was taken there. However, that route was infested with aliens, and an old man with a white beard couldn't help but interrupt. Why did the military capture a child? He believed that Anisha was hiding something, and it seemed that an argument between the two sides was about to break out. Clark pushed the old man with the white beard aside, and then questioned Anisha privately. Is there really a hidden truth in all of this? Anisha hesitated for a while but still refused to speak. However, her eldest son Luke told Clark's daughter about the hidden extraterrestrial meteorite in their possession. Meanwhile, the white-bearded man hiding in the shadows overheard everything. He immediately told everyone about it, accusing Anisha of hiding the extraterrestrial meteorite, and putting everyone in danger. In a critical moment, Clark stepped in to resolve the situation. He lied and claimed that Anisha hadn't intentionally hidden anything from them. He stated that he already knew the truth, and had kept it secret to avoid causing panic. With the leader's intervention, the white-bearded man had no choice but to give up. After this incident, Anisha finally began to trust Clark. The next day, the group set off southwards to rescue the little girl. Meanwhile, in McCurtain County, to investigate multiple cases of missing people, the afro hair female police officer released the detained veteran Bernie without authorization she did so because he possessed a sketchbook, with clues closely related to the missing individuals. Bernie claimed that the sketchbook belonged to a boy named Tim, who could sense the presence of aliens, and establish a connection with them. Although it sounded unbelievable, the woman decided to believe him for once. The two of them looked through the sketchbook together. The woman pointed to one of the pages, and said she knew this place. It was the location where the first missing person disappeared. She immediately drove Bernie to that place. It was a yellow cornfield with crows circling in the air, and the scarecrow from the sketch was nearby. While the two were standing there observing, a mysterious energy came from above. Bernie seemed to sense something and took a step forward, kicking away the weeds on the ground revealing that the sand beneath was constantly shifting. At that moment, strange noises came from a distance. The two followed the sound and found an uncle sitting on a swing. He was the relative of the missing person. The uncle stared blankly into sky, and said that a force had lifted his child into the air. The woman wanted to ask more questions, but the uncle could only repeat himself. On the other side, inside the Dharma Tech Research Institute, the leader James was in a state of distress. They had managed to hack the alien mothership using a captured alien spacecraft winning a battle against the aliens, but it attracted an even more intense counterattack from the extraterrestrials. The extraterrestrial beings that were initially afraid of fire evolved to eliminate this weakness, and became even more unstoppable. To turn the tide and achieve success, they can only rely on the scientist Mistuki, as she is the only person capable of approaching the energy entity of the alien spacecraft. The so-called energy entity is the core of the entire spacecraft, but it is not a mechanical component. Rather, it is an intelligent extraterrestrial life form. At this moment, Mistuki heard a strange sound, but no one besides her could hear it, and the machines detected no signals either. Ever since the energy entity was hacked by humans in communication, it has refused to send any messages. In order to force it to reveal its true intentions, Mistuki decided to take the risk and provoke the energy entity. 
However, the extraterrestrial beings are not like humans. They cannot be easily provoked with a few insults. Mistuki needs to find the right approach. The circling birds outside gave her inspiration. Only when the Earth's magnetic field changes do the flight patterns of birds alter. Currently, the Earth's magnetic field is in chaos, possibly due to a connection with the extraterrestrial beings. To prove this hypothesis, Mistuki immediately installs a magnetic field disruptor around the energy entity, and activates it with her wristband. As expected, the energy entity changes from blue to red, and exhibits intense fluctuations and movements. The next moment, it emits a piercing noise, causing everyone present to cover their ears. Only Mistuki continues to increase the interference frequency, causing the energy entity to experience significant distress. Surprisingly, it emits human voices directly. Upon seeing this, Mistuki immediately shuts off the disruptor. The energy entity in front of her transforms into a human form. The terrifying enemy has turned into a weak human girl who even speaks in Japanese. As soon as she finishes speaking, the girl disappears on the spot, and then the energy entity emits the voice of Mistuki's deceased friend. It entices Mistuki to take off her gloves and touch itself. The staff monitoring from outside senses something is wrong as Mistuki's brainwaves rapidly fluctuate. They immediately initiate emergency measures and pull Mistuki out of the containment area. The doctor promptly conducts a full medical examination on her, fortunately finding no abnormalities. James really wants Mistuki to continue working, but the doctor dragged him out and gave him a lesson. If pushed too hard, she will eventually end up like the previous scientists, becoming a speechless fool. If Mistuki encounters any problems, we will lose our only hope. James can only relent upon hearing this, but Mistuki insists on returning to her post. She prepares herself and enters the containment area once again. This time, the energy entity repeats its tactics, simulating the voice of her deceased friend to entice her to remove her protective helmet. Mistuki simply comply with it. The energy entity slowly approaches her and pulls Mistuki into an illusion realm. It is a precious childhood memory of her dear friend with sunlight, beaches, and everything so beautiful. The younger version of her friend gently persuades Mistuki to stay with her there, without pain, and live in eternal happiness. Mistuki shows a struggling expression upon hearing this, seemingly genuinely deceived by the illusion. The researchers outside are extremely nervous, ready to forcibly bring Mistuki back at any moment. At that moment, a staff member notices her hands trembling slightly, as if tapping out Morse code. The staff member quickly records and deciphers it, realizing that Mistuki is instructing them to increase the interference frequency. It turns out that Mistuki is not lost in the illusion, but deliberately pretending to deceive the energy entity. The researchers immediately increase the disruptor's power, causing the pleasant illusion to freeze instantly. The energy entity struggles intensely, and eventually transforms into a weak, small ball of light, revealing its true form without any disguises. The monitoring devices capture a clear signal, and Mistuki believes it to be the language of extraterrestrials. She believes that with further research, she will be able to communicate directly with them. The scene shifts back to Anisha's side. They had just driven a short distance to the south when they entered a dense fog. Meanwhile, the aliens in the darkness quietly awakened. Suddenly, several images flashed through Luke's mind, and he held his head in pain, saying that there was danger here, and they had to leave immediately. Just as he finished speaking, a large amount of aliens attacked, and the convoy immediately accelerated. However, these aliens had evolved, and bullets couldn't penetrate their exoskeletons. As more and more vehicles were brought down, Luke's headache intensified. He just wanted the noise to stop. To everyone's surprise, as soon as this thought occurred, the aliens actually retreated, before everyone could breathe a sigh of relief. Clark accidentally crashed into a car parked by the roadside, and several people crawled out of the overturned vehicle. Anisha noticed that Clark's thigh was injured, and quickly tended to his wound. Clark couldn't help but ask Luke how he could predict the arrival of the aliens. Anisha explained that this situation had occurred before, and she had thought it was just a coincidence. It seems that Luke, like the owner of the sketchbook Tim, also has the ability to sense aliens. At that moment, their companions arrived, and everyone breathed a sigh of relief upon seeing that their leader was alive. The advance team was one, six kilometers away, and they had to reach there before nightfall. As the group moved forward, Luke once again sensed the presence of aliens. Everyone followed his gaze and shockingly discovered a dormant creature. In the next moment, the aliens regained consciousness. Everyone rushed towards the advance team in a frenzy. The little girl in the group fell behind. Anisha resolutely ran back to find the girl. Fortunately, she was safe, and Anisha quickly pulled her away. They were intercepted by aliens halfway, and Anisha quickly fired at them. But unfortunately, she emptied her entire cartridge clip without harming the aliens. At this critical moment, Luke rushed forward and shouted at the aliens to stop. 
Surprisingly, they were hypnotized, and everyone quickly took the opportunity to retreat. By the time the aliens regained consciousness and caught up, they had already missed the best opportunity, and Anisha and the others successfully escaped the danger. This part of story here comes to an end. Let me take a look at the youth group that hasn't appeared in a long time. Do you still remember the sketchbook in Bernie's hands? A few children were about to go find its owner, Tim, because they believed he could control the aliens. The four of them followed the clues and arrived in Paris, where the streets were deserted, and one side of the walls was covered with missing person notices. Alf picked up a piece of paper from the ground to leave a clue for his parents, and the others followed suit. Their destination was a hospital 10 kilometers away, and they certainly couldn't reach it before nightfall. Fortunately, Monty, the wealthy second generation, had a house in Paris, so the four of them planned to stay there for the night, and take action when it was daylight. As soon as Monty entered, he saw a photo. Lisa asked, you must miss your parents a lot, right? Monty didn't answer but placed the photo on the table. Later, the group gathered in the living room, brought out all the available food, and had a meal while chatting. Monty's younger sister, Amy, held a can of cookies, and couldn't help but express her doubts. We never have peanut cookies at home in the United States, because mom is allergic to peanuts. Upon hearing this, Monty walked away gloomily. From this, we can infer that the woman in the photo earlier was not his mother, but his father's lover. Lisa was awakened by a nightmare in the middle of the night. She noticed that Monty was awake, and staring at those photos. Only after asking did she find out that his father had cheated. In fact, Monty was not angry about his father's affair. He was upset because his father seemed happy, not loving his own child or family, but finding happiness with someone else. The next day, the group finally arrived at the hospital, only to find it in ruins and deserted. Lisa was worried that their trip was in vain, but Monty found Tim's medical records, confirming that the boy had indeed been there. However, they had no idea where he was at the moment, just as they were feeling disheartened and ready to leave. Amy suddenly heard a noise. Everyone followed the sound and arrived at the storeroom, where they saw Tim crouching by the wall. However, he had been unconscious for a long time, and had no memory of what happened at the hospital. Based on the scattered documents on the ground, it could be inferred that there were many children like Tim locked up here. These children, to some extent, could sense aliens, and the hospital staff were researching this mysterious connection. Although the other children had already been evacuated from the hospital, Tim could still hear their voices. Perhaps these special children were the key to defeating the aliens. Lisa decided to follow the voices in Tim's mind, and find the other children first. Monty had some reservations about this arrangement. For some reason, he felt that Tim was like an empty shell. However, Lisa had complete trust in Tim, so Monty had to suppress his doubts and follow along. It started to rain in Paris that day, and the five of them took shelter in a nearby grocery store to find raincoats. Suddenly, there was a loud noise outside. Lisa asked Tim to sense the alien's location. But in reality, the boy couldn't feel anything. The next moment, the crashing sound rang out again, and they had to leave as soon as possible. Faced with two different paths, Lisa handed over the choice to Tim again. Tim led everyone towards the rear, but they unexpectedly ran into the aliens head-on. They quickly turned around and fled, only to run into a dead end. Lisa quickly opened the door of the building on the street. She led everyone into the building. Everyone ran up to the rooftop in one breath. They saw the aliens catching up. No one knows how much longer could the lock hold. Lisa quickly surveyed the surroundings. She led everyone to climb down along the drainpipe. They successfully escaped from the aliens' attack. They found a safe place to make a fire. Lisa decided to have a chat with Tim. She believed that Tim's lack of sensation was due to his disrupted memories. Lisa handed Tim a pair of headphones. They listened to their favorite songs together. The familiar music made Tim feel at ease. Monty, however, was jealous of their intimacy. On the other side, Bernie and the woman left the cornfield. They went back to continue studying the art book. The woman marked the various missing locations on the map. Bernie connected several points into a line. They discovered that it perfectly matched the spiral pattern in the art book. They believed that the center of the spiral was crucial. So, they went to the cornfield once again to search for the truth. Unexpectedly, the farm corresponding to the center of the spiral had already been surrounded by a large number of soldiers. This precisely indicated that something was wrong with this place since it was heavily guarded. They couldn't easily infiltrate, and could only hide in the dark to observe. They saw several soldiers using detectors to investigate the central circular hole. There was a faint blue light emanating from the entrance of the hole. The woman took out her phone to record. However, they were spotted by the soldiers ahead. Bernie and the woman quickly ran away, but the soldiers behind them chased closely. Fortunately, Bernie was a former frontline special forces soldier. He swiftly took down the pursuers. They hid in a concealed place, and waited for an opportunity. Bernie turned to the page in the sketchbook showing the black hole. The center was also adorned with blue. Tim had seen this scene before, they had to figure out what was inside the hole. Bernie scattered breadcrumbs along the necessary path to the camp. 
This way, a flock of crows blocked the military vehicle's path. The soldiers had to stop the vehicles and shoot to scare away the birds. Bernie took this opportunity to hide under one of the vehicles and infiltrate the camp. Meanwhile, Anissa and the others had arrived at the southern military camp. Soldiers were everywhere in this place. The white-bearded man immediately became hesitant. Was it necessary for them to risk so many lives just to save one girl? Anissa understood everyone's thoughts. No one wanted to lose their comrades and friends for someone unrelated. But the reason they formed an alliance was to protect everyone to the best of their abilities. Today, it was her daughter in danger. But tomorrow, who knew who would be next? If they didn't help this time and continued to abstain, what would be the meaning of their alliance? The white-bearded man wasn't an unreasonable person. He agreed to help rescue Sarah. To enter the camp, they could only use strategy. First, Luke disguised himself as an injured orphan and sought help from the soldier guarding the gate. Then Clark and his companions took the opportunity to launch a surprise attack. They disabled the gate security system. Then they activated the alarm in the guardroom. Anissa, on the other hand, drove into the camp. The soldiers, upon seeing the intrusion, quickly surrounded them. I mean, what the hell you think you're doing? Gathering you all to a central location. Surrounded! Put your guns down! In this way, Clark's group successfully took control of the camp. They tied up the leading officer and interrogated him. However, the officer remained silent and refused to speak. He also claimed that if half of the troops weren't out on patrol, they wouldn't have stood a chance to infiltrate. Anissa saw familiar handwriting on the wall and believed that her daughter was indeed captured there. She retrieved a vial of chemical agent from a cabinet, claiming that injecting 60 milligrams would instantly kill the officer. Just as the needle was about to pierce his skin, the officer finally revealed the truth. The little girl was taken to McCurtain County, where everything started. McCurtain County was where Bernie was located, and it seemed that there was indeed an undisclosed secret there. At that moment, Bernie had already infiltrated the military camp, and coincidentally encountered the little girl, Sarah, being taken into a room. The soldier behind him was still holding a piece of extraterrestrial meteorite. Bernie hid in the shadows, waiting for the right moment. As darkness fell, he swiftly took down a patrolling soldier, holding a flashlight in his mouth. He entered the interior of the circular hole. He descended along the vertical ladder. He discovered another door leading further into the depths. Before Bernie could enter, the soldier on duty found him. Bernie was escorted to another room. On the way, he saw a group of dull patients. At a glance, Bernie recognized them as the missing residents. Why were they being held captive here? The soldiers locked the puzzled Bernie inside the room. Soon, the general from the camp arrived to interrogate him. Through their conversation, it became clear that the missing villagers had been abducted by aliens, and the Alliance military had rescued them, and brought them here for confidential treatment. As for how the military had rescued the people, it was classified as a high-level military secret, and the general certainly wouldn't disclose it to Bernie. Bernie suggested that instead of keeping him locked up, they should let him help. However, the general ignored his request, and locked Bernie in the camp's prison cell. Meanwhile, the woman, not waiting for his return, decided to take the risk and venture inside to rescue him. Before leaving, she entrusted Tim's sketchbook to a trusted colleague at the police station. I need you to take that notebook serious. Receiving their assurance, and then set off on her journey. Meanwhile, inside the Dharma Tech Research Institute, Mitsuki was still studying the alien language, but encountered a difficult challenge. She became extremely nervous, realizing that if she didn't adjust herself in time, she might end up like the demented scientists. The doctor advised her to take a break, so Mitsuki went to visit the other scientists. These individuals had all suffered mental breakdowns after coming into contact with the energy entity, turning into crazy and foolish appearances. Mitsuki suddenly noticed their twitching fingers, as if they were transmitting some kind of signal. Perhaps these people were communicating in the language of the aliens. On the other side, the group of teenagers, led by Tim, managed to locate the hiding place of the other children. Despite the thick walls separating them, their connection and intuition grew stronger. Tim crawled into a narrow opening. As expected, he saw the hospital researchers, and all the children with special abilities. The researchers were surprised that Tim was still alive. When the hospital was invaded by aliens, they couldn't take the unconscious Tim. They had assumed he couldn't survive, but not only was Tim alive, he had also found this place. No one could explain everything clearly. Among these children, Tim had the strongest connection with the aliens. Each child said they had seen him in their visions, in a very mysterious space. To figure out where Tim had been trapped during his coma, everyone picked up their brushes, and together reconstructed the space from their visions. Lisa approached a girl with a ponytail, and thanked them for never ceasing to call out to Tim. If it hadn't been for those voices, they would never have found this place. Unexpectedly, the girl said they weren't calling out to Tim. There was another person far away, 
Could that person be referring to Luke or Mitsuki? The scene shifted back to Mitsuki. She was using her equipment to collect the scientist's voice data in an attempt to continue deciphering the alien language. James became somewhat anxious upon seeing this. Why are you putting so much effort into studying the alien language? Are you planning to negotiate or something? James asked. Impatiently, he urged Mitsuki to continue making contact with the energy entity, and not to waste any more time. Mitsuki could only return to the enclosed area to attempt contact with the energy entity again. However, her specially designed equipment malfunctioned, and it would take at least a day to repair. James became frustrated upon hearing this. He asked the doctor if she was responsible for the equipment malfunction. The doctor admitted to tampering with the equipment, and stated that considering Mitsuki's current condition, she should not continue making contact with the energy entity. The doctor suggested that if James was truly in a hurry, he should enter the area himself. James angrily went back to the enclosed area, while the doctor bid farewell to Mitsuki. She didn't want to stay in this place anymore, and advised Mitsuki to stay alert at all times. Shortly after, an alarm sounded in the research center. It turned out that James had indeed gone to meet the energy entity. Moreover, the entire center, and its surrounding area of tens of miles were shaking. The doctor noticed the change in the situation and quickly returned. It turned out that the radical James had pushed the disruptor to its limit. This action resulted in a massive chain reaction. Suddenly, the cornfields in McCurtain County, where Tim and others were located, experienced intense reactions in the laboratory. All the children had excruciating headaches, except Tim, who showed no reaction at all. Meanwhile, the Earth Alliance Center detected major earthquakes occurring simultaneously in over a dozen locations. On the other side, a woman took advantage of the chaos and entered the camp, but before finding Bernie, she was captured by the surrounding soldiers. In order to quickly stop the chaotic situation, Mitsuki and the doctor rushed into the enclosed area, and pulled the unconscious James out. The fluctuations in the energy entity might still be ongoing, so Mitsuki entered the enclosed area at a critical moment. The energy entity immediately surrounded her, intending to engulf Mitsuki, who posed a threat. However, Mitsuki suddenly rolled up her sleeve, and revealed the disruptor, instantly raising it to the maximum level. The energy entity was completely eliminated. Earthquakes in various locations returned to normal. Upon waking up, Mitsuki immediately checked the data on James' protective suit. Since the moment the other party entered the enclosed area, the atmosphere around him began to change. In other words, the energy entity was the entrance for humans to enter the alien nest, but Mitsuki had just destroyed it. The doctor reported this matter to the person in charge of the alliance, and they requested a conversation with Mitsuki. However, at the moment, Mitsuki couldn't talk to anyone, she couldn't believe she had destroyed the only entrance, and was frantically searching for other ways, but in reality, Mitsuki could barely even hold a pencil. Just then, she heard a voice calling out to her, and Mitsuki followed the guidance and went outside. The birds in the sky were still flying in circles, indicating that the Earth's magnetic field still influenced various organisms, including the hidden extraterrestrial beings. If one wants to find the entrance, they must become a part of the network of relationships. Mitsuki knelt on the ground, and relieved pressure, muttering to herself, what exactly do these things connect? Suddenly, a boy's voice rang out. And at the same time, Tim experienced an unexpected event. He saw a beam of strong light that he couldn't approach. Tim speculated that the aliens didn't want him to discover that light, and perhaps the light beam was the alien nest. The map the children had jointly drawn was complete, showing ten different subway stations, but there were no railway tracks connecting them. With these scattered fragments of information, it was impossible to determine the exact location. Tim decided to enter a coma state once again to piece together these fragments. Just as Tim put on the device and entered a coma, Mitsuki remembered the doctor's words. To establish a connection with the extraterrestrial beings, she had to open her heart and overcome obstacles. The next moment, Mitsuki closed her eyes, and when she opened them again, she found herself in a mysterious space. Mitsuki could sense someone on the other side of the wall. She bypassed the wall in front of her, and finally saw Tim. Tim introduced to Mitsuki that as long as humans establish a connection with the extraterrestrial beings, their thoughts will enter this place. This place acts as a central hub connecting various extraterrestrial beings, and the blue light column in the center is likely the alien nest. Once they enter it, they can reach the mothership. The next moment, both of them woke up simultaneously. On the other side, Anissa was on her way to McCurtain County, searching for her daughter, Sarah. Fortunately, Sarah was not in danger of illness. An officer was questioning her about the extraterrestrial meteorite. I think my brother knows how to talk to him. At that moment, Anissa and Clark were escorting the military leader into McCurtain County, and using leader's identification information, the group stopped near a cornfield. Clark instructed the children to stay in place while he, and his subordinates immediately went to find Sarah's whereabouts. 
they used cornstalks as cover, continuously throwing grenades to attract attention, and divert the soldiers using diversion tactics. Clark and Anissa took the opportunity to sneak into the camp, and search various rooms, and they first came across Bernie with a woman. Bernie identified that these two individuals were not soldiers by observing their military boots. Upon learning that Anissa was looking for her daughter, Bernie remembered the little girl he had seen before, and offered his assistance. Anissa decided to trust Bernie once, and helped him open the electronic lock. Unfortunately, they were discovered shortly after they had not gone far. Bernie asked Anissa to give him the gun, and helped attract the enemy's fire, urging them to hurry and save the daughter. Anissa searched nervously in all directions, and finally caught sight of her daughter. She immediately shattered the lighting fixture, and rushed forward to grab Sarah and escape. To their surprise, they were caught just after exiting through the back door. Meanwhile, Bernie, during the retreat, took the woman to the place where the villagers were held captive. The woman recognized her ex-husband and neighbor, but they were unresponsive, like vegetative beings. The woman wanted to take them away, but Bernie understood that leaving the villagers there was the best choice. At least the people from the Alliance will try to save them. After saying that, he left with the woman. Little did he know, before they had walked a few meters, Bernie heard Tim's voice. Tim asked the woman to go ahead, and wait while he followed. Why could he hear Tim's voice? Because Tim was currently talking to the Earth Alliance leader, and the general at the McCurtain County camp. Tim believed that with Mistuki's help, they could definitely find the physical location of the mothership in reality, and convert it into a tangible form. Once that happened, they could send troops to annihilate it and completely end this disaster. While the three of them were engrossed in their heated discussion, Bernie had already followed the sound and arrived. He was greatly surprised to see Tim on the screen. Since getting the sketchbook from the boy, they hadn't seen each other. Upon learning that they were planning to attack the mothership, Bernie wanted to join the team. However, the commanding officer didn't like soldiers who didn't follow orders, and immediately rejected Bernie's proposal. At the same time, Clark and the others were unable to rescue Anissa and her daughter. However, through the captured walkie-talkies, they learned that the Alliance forces were planning to attack the extraterrestrial mothership, and Luke also sensed that the aliens were collectively mobilizing, and heading towards the same location, they must want to protect their mothership. Upon hearing this, everyone hesitated whether they should stay and help. At that moment, the Alliance forces surrounded the area. In a critical moment, Luke rushed to the door, and said that he could help find the entrance to the mothership. But the soldiers didn't believe a child's words, so Luke clenched his fists in frustration. To their surprise, Luke managed to control one of the aliens. Seeing this, the soldiers finally believed Luke, and immediately contacted the general. On the other end, the general didn't give Anissa, and her daughter a hard time. He just wanted to understand how to use the extraterrestrial meteorite, and whether Luke could communicate with the aliens. Now, there's no need for Anissa to speak up, Luke had already volunteered to help find the entrance. At this moment, the boy was leading a large force towards the aliens' direction. The place where they were gathering must be the mothership. Finally, Luke stopped at the center of the town, and just then, an explosion sounded from behind. Immediately, countless aliens rushed forward to stop them. The soldiers present immediately opened fire, and Bernie picked up a few grenades, and rushed into the battlefield. As it seemed like they couldn't withstand the onslaught, Luke sensed the help of other children. The consciousness of everyone connected as one, and together, they managed to control all the aliens. Just then, Mistuki was also ready. She sensed the situation at the scene. Now it was necessary to send a signal to deactivate the mothership's cloaking, but it required an incredibly strong mental power. With the help of the doctor, Mistuki calmed down. In an instant, all sensations came rushing to her, touch of the earth, scent of rainwater, the calming coolness of the night air. She successfully controlled her thoughts, and opened the entrance to the alien mothership. Three fully equipped soldiers appeared, advancing towards the entrance with meteorite pieces extracted from the cornfield. But the energy entity started wildly fluctuating, sending the three men flying several meters away. On the other side, Mistuki was also reaching her limit. She asked the doctor to erase all her memories, believing that only by losing everything could she truly focus. The doctor knew there was no other choice, and had to let her proceed. Mistuki entered the consciousness of the energy entity, but also lost her own. After sacrificing herself, she stabilized the entrance to the mothership. Upon seeing the energy mass stabilize, Bernie quickly removed the protective suit from the corpse and put it on. The general handed him the extraterrestrial meteorite. With determination, Bernie entered the mothership. Mistuki instantly collapsed to the ground, and immediately after, the entrance disappeared before everyone's eyes. Bernie entered the mysterious space, not understanding the purpose of the extraterrestrial meteorite. He stabbed it into the glowing wall, and that piece of tissue instantly necrotized. It seems that this thing is the natural enemy of the aliens. Just then, Tim also entered the realm of thoughts. The two of them walked towards the central beam of light together. The content of the second season concludes here. I didn't expect this season to be the end yet. 
It seems that if we want to know the situation of the mothership, we can only patiently wait for the next season to come. Overall, the quality is still good, for different storylines, advancing towards the same goal simultaneously, and gradually converge against the backdrop of a massive doomsday. The storytelling is smooth and the transitions are natural. Achieving this is already quite difficult. Unfortunately, the director is just too verbose. They unnecessarily prolong the story that could have been completed in one season. The most outrageous thing is dragging it for two seasons, and still not wrapping it up. This will only wear down the audience's patience.